Today I'd like to look at a class of algebras which are not necessarily associative known as alternative algebras. And in fact, you've probably heard of one of the most famous examples of an alternative algebra already, which we'll look at at the end of the video. Okay, so let's look at the definition. So an alternative algebra A is a vector space over a field. You almost always want to start with this kind of setup. For an associative algebra, also for a Lie algebra, you start with a vector space over a field. And for an alternative algebra, you do as well. So not only do you have a vector space over a field, but you've got a multiplication rule for vectors in this vector space. And it's got to satisfy some rules. And those rules go like this. So for vectors a, b, and c from the algebra a, and for scalars a and b from the ground field, which I've called f here, we have the following maybe axioms. So we've got these nice distribution rules for vector addition and the multiplication between vectors. Then we've got these nice distributive rules for addition of scalars and scalar multiplication over like addition of vectors and so on and so forth. We've also got this nice rule right here that talks about how the scalar multiplication interacts with the multiplication of vectors. And then you've got the axiom that makes it an alternative algebra. And that is these two rules right here. So notice these do not imply associativity. So we have a times ab is equal to aa times b, where we've associated it as I've written with those parentheses there. We also have a times bb is equal to ab times b. So let's first notice that every associative algebra is most definitely an alternative algebra. And why is that? Well, notice for every associative algebra, you have the following rule. So let's maybe write that here. So if you have an associative algebra, then you know A times BC is equal to A times B times C. And that's gonna hold for all A, B, and C inside of our algebra. But if that holds for all A times B times C, then if maybe we we'll replace, for instance, C with B, you'll get this rule right here. And then if we do some sort of other replacement, we'll get this orange rule right here. So needless to say, every associative algebra is alternative. Okay, cool. And this is not true for all non-associative algebras. For instance, every associative algebra is not a Lie algebra. Well, actually it kind of is, but you have to define a new definition of the product known as the commutator. Here, every associative algebra is an alternative algebra with the same multiplication. Okay, so next up I'd like to look at the question, why do we use the word alternative? And in order to do that, I'm going to define something called the associator. So let's do that. And what it is, well, it's got to have three inputs. And it is the difference between A times BC and AB times C. So notice if we've got an associative algebra, this is identically equal to zero. But if we have a non-associative algebra, then this is not identically equal to zero. And what we'll show is that this is a so-called alternating multilinear form if we have an alternating algebra. So what do we mean by an alternating multilinear form? Well, what we mean is if any entry is repeated, we get zero. So that's, like I said, what alternating means or what alternative means here. So that'll break down into three cases. So the first case is that a, a, b must be equal to zero. The second case is that a, b, b is equal to zero. And then the third case is that a, b, a is also equal to zero. So those are the three possibilities of having one of the entries repeated. Okay, well, let's do the calculation for the first two which is really quite short. 
So let's notice that AA, B, by our definition of the associator is equal to A times AB minus AA times B. That's just by the definition of the associator. Oh, but by one of our rules forming the definition of an alternative algebra, we know that both of those terms are the same, so their difference is zero. Okay, so it seems like, well, this one always holds. But now let's look at ABB. So what will we get for that? Well, you know, this is gonna work out very, very similarly. So that's gonna be A times BB minus AB times B, which is again equal to zero because of, well, now it's this right-hand rule. So we have this thing is also satisfied. So that means all we need to do to show that this is in fact alternative is to prove this third rule. And let's do that now. So let's take the associator ABA and maybe write that out in terms of its definition first. So that'll be A times BA minus AB times A. But now we need a trick, and the trick will be to add zero to this. So this is one of a mathematician's favorite tricks. And we just have to decide what version of zero do we need to add. And the version we'll add is built out of these identities right here. Well, really written with zero on one side of the equation, if you will. Okay. So here I'll add on the following. It'll be A times A plus B times A plus B. And then I need to subtract the same thing. But since A plus B is repeated, I can apply this rule right here to reassociate. So I can't reassociate all the time. That's the whole point of this video. But I can reassociate if the terms are repeated like this. Okay, so anyway, let's rewrite it. So this is gonna be A times A plus B times A plus B. Great. And like I said, this is simply equal to zero by the axioms of an alternative algebra. So next up what we'll do is multiply out these magenta terms. But before we do that, I need to bring this down. So we'll have A times B A minus A B times A. And then multiplying this first one out will give us the following. So notice we'll have AA times A. And then next up, we'll have AB times A. And then next up, we'll have AA times B. And finally, AB times B. Okay, good. So let's maybe color code this a little bit. I'll underline this in green, and that's exactly what we have expanded right here. Notice I was careful to keep the first two terms associated because that's how I've got this set up. But now we're gonna take the difference with, well, it'll essentially be the same thing, but now the second two terms are associated. So let's write that out. So we'll have minus A times AA, and then minus A times BA, and then minus A times AB, and then minus A times BB. Okay, so again, that's this thing being expanded over here. Let's color code one more time with an underline in blue. And now let's cancel everything we can cancel. So here we've got an A times BA, Let's see if we can find that, and we can. It's right here, A times BA. So this term will cancel this term. Now let's find an AB times A. So do we see that anywhere? Well, we do, it's right here. And they have opposite signs, so those will cancel as well. Now what's next? Here we've got an AA times A. Oh, and here we have an A times AA. But those are the same because of one of our rules over here. So the first two things that we were canceled were exactly the same. Everything that we're gonna cancel from this point onward will be the same because of our you know, weak associativity rules. Okay, so here we've got AA times B, and here we've got minus A times AB. But again, by our rules, those are the same. 
And then we've got one more thing to do. We've got AB times B and A times BB, but again, those are the same as well. Oh, but check it out, everything canceled. So we got this is equal to zero. But that was the last thing we needed to check. Now an alternative algebra satisfies all of these. But in fact, there's a special type of algebra that only satisfies one of these. And so this third one actually has a name on its own. And let's write this third one out as A times BA equals AB times A. And this is known as the flexible identity. So if you take an alternative algebra and you look for the thing that is next closest in terms of associativity, you would get, well, something called power associativity. I'll let you look that up if you need to, and this so-called flexible identity. So this single identity here does not imply the other two, but that being said, these first two identities do imply this third identity. And that's actually hidden in this proof right here. That's because these first two identities are essentially just these axioms down here for an alternative algebra, which is you know, the only thing we needed to prove this third identity. Okay, so anyway, why is it called alternative? Because we have an alternating multilinear form here. That's why it's called an alternative algebra. Now, you might say, well, this isn't exactly the definition of alternating that I've seen. I've seen another definition with the concept of permuting entries. Well, it turns out that these are the same. And let's maybe write that down just for completeness and check a simple case. So another way of defining uh, alternating property for a multilinear form is based on what happens when you permute the entries. And, well, for the case when you have three entries, it goes like this. So A1, A2, A3, well, I should say the associator of A1, A2, A3 is equal to the signum of sigma, or the sine of sigma, of A sigma 1, A sigma 2, A sigma 3, where sigma is a permutation of the set 1, 2, 3. In other words, it's in S3. And let's just recall that the sine of sigma is equal to 1 when sigma is an even permutation. Now, if you don't know what that is, it's either the identity permutation, the permutation that sends one to two, two to three, and three back to one, or the permutation that sends one to three, three to two, and two back to one. Those are the even permutations in S3. And it's equal to negative one if sigma is an odd permutation. In other words, in this case, it must be a transposition. So transposing one and two, but fixing three, one and three and fixing two, or two and three and fixing one. Now, just as a quick example of that, let's look at the case when sigma is equal to one, two. And here we're gonna look at the associator of A2, A1, A3. And I guess like here, we're kind of dividing this sine of sigma over, or that's the result that we're getting at, but dividing by one or minus one is the same thing as multiplying by it. So there's no big deal there. Okay, so let's write this out in terms of the definition. So this is A2, A1, A3 minus A2, A1, A3. And we're gonna use essentially the same idea that we did before, and that is add zero and see what happens. And the zero will be constructed, you know, fairly similarly to what we had before. So here I'm gonna subtract A1 plus A2 times A1 plus A2, A3, and then I'll add that in as well. So, but I'll add it in where we've applied this rule. So we'll have A1 plus A2 times itself associated times A3. And you know, this is a fairly lengthy, well, it's not that lengthy, but it's a little bit of a calculation. But what you'll see in the end is that at the last step, you'll end up with minus A1 times A2, A3, minus A1 times A2 times A3, where I factored that minus sign out. But that's indeed equal to minus the associator of A1, A2, A3 kind of as needed or as predicted by this other definition of alternating.
Okay, so now I think we've got at least kind of an idea of what an alternative algebra is. Now let's look at a famous example. So here's the promised example that you might have already heard of, of an alternative algebra. But to set the stage, let's look at the following constructions of algebras over R. So you can think about R, the real numbers, as being a one-dimensional algebra over itself. You can boost that up to the complex numbers, which is now two-dimensional, and it's still commutative and associative. You can boost that up to the quaternions, which is no longer commutative, but it is associative, and that's four-dimensional. You can boost that up to the octonions, and it's no longer associative, but it is alternative. And then you can boost that up to something called the Sidonians, which are 16-dimensional, and it's no longer alternative, but it does satisfy that flexible identity that we spoke about earlier. Okay, so anyway, on to the Octonians, because that's an example of an alternative algebra. So it's eight-dimensional, so its basis vectors are the number one, so that's like the multiplicative identity. And then these vectors that I'll call E1, E2, up to E7. And so everything can be written as a linear combination of those. And each of these vectors, E1 up through E7, are roots of negative 1. So that means we have EI squared is equal to negative 1 as long as I is between 1 and 7. Well, those are the only vectors that we're defining here. So that's pretty similar to what's happening in the quaternions. We have i squared equals j squared equals k squared equals minus 1. And in the complex numbers, there we just only have one thing though. And then the rest of the multiplication can be described by the following diagram. And so in order to find out the product of two elements, you follow the path between them in the prescribed definition. And if you move in the opposite direction, then you'll pick up a minus sign. And furthermore, all of these straight lines are seen as loops. So let's look at an example here. So E6 times E3 will be E4. So let's write that down. E6 times E3 will be E4 because we moved in this direction. But then E1 times E5 will be E6 because again, this is seen as like a loop. So E1 times E5 is equal to, like I said, E6. Then again, I mentioned that you could move in the opposite direction and pick up a minus sign. So E1 times E4 will be minus E2. So E1, E4 will be minus E2. Furthermore, I mentioned that, well, this is an alternative algebra and that it's non-associative. So let's check that it's non-associative. Let's look at E1 times E2 times E3 versus E1 times E2 times E3. So these should not be the same. So let's see, by our diagram, E1 times E2 is E4. So this gives us E4 times E3. But now that has to go in the opposite direction of the arrow. So E4 times E3 is negative E6. So there we've got it, negative E6. Now let's do in the opposite or the uh, other association. So E2 times E3, so E2 times E3 will be E5. So there we have E1 times E5. Oh, but look, we already calculated E1 times E5 up here and it's E6. Oh, so look at what we've got here. We do not have associativity because we picked up a minus sign, so these are not equal. So there we have it. There's an example of an alternative algebra that you might have heard of before. Now this string of constructions, starting at the real numbers and doubling the dimension at all times, is called the cayley dickinson construction. I think I'm gonna make a whole video about it. Maybe post in the comments if you'd like to see that. And if you've stuck around this long and you're not subscribed, maybe consider subscribing. It really helps the channel out, and that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpinmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.